Good evening and welcome to the second event of Iran series at the Legatum. Uh, and this event is on the um, post-election Iran, uh, which has taken place in 26th of February. Um, and this event is held in association with the ideologistic. Quoting an Applebaum, the columnist, historian, and the director of the Legatum Transition Forum, elections are funny things and electorates are fickle. Uh, in her conversation with our panel of experts, they examined the outcome of Iran's funny elections and its impact on Iran's opening up internally and externally. The panel of, uh, our panel of experts are Saeed Barzin, <coughs> of the BBC Monitoring, who for the past 18 months has monitored every single word in Iran's media about the election and sent it via a Google subscription email to Iran experts. Uh, Hossein Bastoni, who's sitting here, um, a BBC TV analyst whose mathematical calculation showed how voters could omit certain candidates and it caused damning reaction from the conservatives. Hossein Rassam, uh, analyst of Iran Affair and founder member of uh, Rasta Ideologistic, who fled Iran after 2009 infamous election, <laughs> and Sanam Vakil of John Hopkins University, who follows Iran foreign affairs. Um, and I can plan to have the conversation. Right, thank you. And I should say Sharon didn't introduce herself, but Sharon is the, is Sharon Tabari is the organizer of our Iran series, and um, I'd like to thank her for actually putting together this very brilliant um, and impressive panel tonight. Um, so as Sharon said, the, the, the point of this is to have an informal conversation about what just happened in the Iranian elections. Um, I know that the audience consists of some great experts and some relative newcomers to the subject, so we're going to try and do a range of, um, a range of issues. Um, we'll talk, the four of us will speak for about 35, 45 minutes, and then I will very happily take questions from the audience. And you know, the purpose is just to analyze and try and understand better what happened, and also to throw the argument a little bit into the future to see what, um, what guesses we can make about how this will affect um, Iran going forward, particularly in foreign policy, but not only. Um, I'm going to start with Saeed Barzin, of, as Sharon said, of BBC Monitoring, and one of, therefore, one of the main sources on Iran for really pretty much everybody um, in, in Britain. And I asked him if he would start, and I'll, I'll ask him now, would he start by talking a little bit about setting up the election for us from the Iranian perspective, not from our perspective, but from the Iranian perspective, what did people think they were voting for? And what did they, um, what did they expect to get out of elections like these? They, the, there, there are some restrictions on Iranian elections. Not everybody is allowed to be a candidate. There are restrictions on what the media can say and write about elections. Um, and so when Iranians go out to vote, um, what are they intending to achieve? And, and, and what does the regime want to achieve from the elections as well? So, yeah, so. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Anne. Um, le let me just uh, start off by setting the context of the elections mm -hmm. and then explaining how I saw the elections uh, as a social contract between the uh, Islamic regime and, and the population at large. Um, the elections were not a, a revolution, they were not a total upheaval, they were not a total change in the political uh, uh, structure of I Iranian politics. However, they were significant, they were important, they had an impact. They have an impact domestically and they will have an impact in uh, uh, foreign affairs and international relations. They were important uh, for a number of reasons, and I hope that in, in the discussions these uh, issues will come up in foreign affairs, in domestic affairs, in terms of uh, political, uh, domestic uh, political balance. But um, they were somewhat unexpected as well, because uh, uh, while most uh, analysts were thinking, well, what's going to be the outcome of these elections? What's going to be different about these ones? We've had them before. We saw that the conservatives, the, the right-wing hard uh, liners in the political establishment suffered badly as the result of their elections. In Tehran, they were totally wiped out. They lost 46 seats in Tehran alone. 
Um, so it, is, it, it was totally embarrassing for them, for these people who believed they had the total control of the political establishment. Now, the elections were held for two houses, one the House of Parliament Majlis and one for the, the Assembly of Experts, which is uh, 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 responsible for appointing uh, or choosing the leader. That is its sole function. Now, in the, in the parliament, uh, the parliament has been under the control of the conservatives and the right wing, the hardliners, for the past three terms, for 12 years. This has changed. And this is significant. It has changed. Although the uh, pro-government people do not have total uh, majority in the House, they have a comfortable uh, control of, of the majlis. The situation in the majlis is that now we have a pro-government uh, camp which includes the reformists, the moderates, and some uh, conservative elements. We have the opposition camp, uh, which includes the uh, right-wingers and the hardliners, and we have the independents. And they all have similar share of the seats, more or less a third of the seats. Now, uh, there, uh, it is possible, and this is most likely going to happen, there's going to be a working relationship between the uh, pro-government camp and the independents. So they will form a majority, a comfortable majority. The independent uh, MPs usually seek uh, financial resources and political backing in order to look after their own constituents uh, back in, in, in their own uh, areas. So they will look towards the government camp uh, for, for economic resources and political backing. So the, co the government of President Rouhani should be pretty comfortable in passing through its major bills. Uh, the hardliners will definitely be vocal. They will be vocal, they will uh, uh, try to uh, cause uh, trouble, but if the numbers are between 10 and 20 in the uh, new parliament, which is most like, likely going to be in, uh, they will not be in a position to cause any uh, uh, serious problem uh, for President Rouhani's uh, economic program, which is what he's, he's looking at at the moment. With the Assembly of Experts, the situation is a little bit different. In the Assembly of Experts, we have a big uh, uh, right-wing hardline majority and we have a small uh, moderate minority. However, the critical factor in the assembly of experts whose sole responsibility is to choose the uh, next leader is the one-third factor. One-third factor. Why one-third factor? Because the House needs two-thirds of the votes to choose the next leader. Therefore, if you are in a minority position, and you have one third of the vote plus one, you are in a negotiating position. You can bargain with the majority. So if the, uh, the, the minority moderates have one third plus one, they will be in a position to uh, deal, uh, negotiate and bargain with the majority conservatives. So a big shift in the assembly of experts, which has been for the past 30 or so years under the control of the right wing and the uh, and the uh, 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 hardliners. Now, in terms of what people think, um, I see these elections as a form of social contract. And I will explain what I mean uh, uh, by, by social contract. You see, the, the regime, more than anything else, needs legitimacy. Mm -hmm. It needs to strengthen its uh, social base. This is the fundamental thing, and the, the, the leader has uh, said this repeatedly. Voting in the elections means giving the regime legitimacy, which it does. If you are going to the polling station and putting your vote in that box, you, you, it means that you're trusting the system. It means you're trusting the establishment. It means you're working with the, with the, with the regime. So, and the leader wanted people to go out to strengthen the legitimacy of the political system. And what was he offering for, 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 for the vote? What was he offering instead? He said it a number of times. He said, we will give you security, and think of security in the context of Middle East. Think of security in the context of Damascus. Think of security in the context of Yemen. Think of security in the context of Libya. And for an Iranian, that makes sense. And he was offering economic uh, opportunities. He said, we will look after the people economically. So this was his second uh, uh, offer. And the third offer was for the Iranian people to choose between political programs which were somewhat different. 
were somewhat different. This was his third offer, which he allowed people to, uh, uh, to, to make a choice between different pro political program, programs which have different political and social consequences for the people. And the people accepted this offer. They knew that the elections were not free. They knew that the elections were not fair. They knew that the elections were not just. But they participated in the process. Why? Because those three elements which the system was offering them were reasonable, and they thought that by participation in the elections, they could impact on the political process and make a difference uh, 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 for their own future. This was a social deal, a social deal, a social contract in a Hobbesian sense, that you are aware that you give up a certain uh, 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 section of your liberty to the state, to the ruling authority. In, 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 in return, you have security of life and you have security of property. So there was a, a contract of sorts uh, between the state, and, uh, the authority, and the people. So this was a general context uh, of the elections in, in practical terms. And the uh, social contract, which I believe was the fundamental uh, paradigm of, of behavior. Can I just ask you briefly, in, in past Iranian elections, um, the question of boycotting has been an important issue. Was that the case this time? Were, were, well, were, there, were, there, were there organized attempts to boycott them in a, in a, as a form of protest? Well, I think the uh, people who boycotted were very much less vocal this time mm -hmm. uh, in terms of political groups which uh, actively go out to uh, and call for the boycott of the elections where we're much less vocal. Mm -hmm. um, and we know that if we trust the figures given out by the regime, that 62% mm -hmm. of the people participated, which I think is a respectable figure by any standards. 30% of the people in any society uh, don't bother to vote. So a 10% uh, 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 group maybe actively boycotted the election. So I, I think, generally speaking, the voice, the platform for boycott was much less vocal More this time, time than in the past. Um, I'm going to turn now to Hussein Bastani of BBC Persian um, and, uh, and ask you, could you um, dissect a little bit for us what it means um, when we talk about reformers? Can you dissect them? Who are they? Um, you know, we, you know we, we know that a lot of people applied to run as reformers and were turned down. So, so what is this group voting block and why did people support it? When we talk about reformists or reformers, normally we are referring to different, two, di two different concepts. One is reformist versus conservative. Another one is reformist versus pro-regime change, making mm. significant changes you know, within the Islamic Republic of Iran. When you are talking about Iran's elections and you are talking about reformists, you are referring to the first con concept. Mm -hmm. uh, there are those political figures in Iran who are in favor of making step-by-step -step changes within the Iranian political system in order to reform it. Uh, <clears throat> normally, they are in favor of, uh, you know, more freedom of expression, more free elections, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, but a, a better relations with the international community. But they are not in favor of changing the fundamentals of, of the Islamic, Islamic Republic, Republic of Iran. Yeah. And it should be clear that in this election, for example, in the Majlis election, in Iran's election, we have two, in Iran's Majlis, we have 290 members in the parliament. And only 70, only 70 reformist candidates were qualified by the Guardian Council. The Guardian Council is a, is a governmental body which is responsible for the, for the qualification of the candidates in the Iranian uh, elections. We had only 70 uh, candidates who were qualified by the Guardian Council. It was the reason why the reformists had to make a big coalition with the moderate conservatives. Mm -hmm. uh, let me just present some figures about the, the elections with no analysis. You know, in the first, uh, because every candidate in order to become a member, an MP, uh, they need at least 25% of the votes of, uh, of the votes, you know, cast in the, the, in the first round of the elections. Uh, 20, uh, 221 candidates were elected in the first round of the elections. So for 69 other seats, there will be a second round of the elections. In the first round, uh, the, the coalition that was supported by the reformists, 
I don't call them reformists, because all of them were not reformists. Some of them were moderate conservatives. The coalition that was supported by the reformists uh, could have 83 candidates elected in the first run of the, of the elections. For the, the, the coalition of conservatives, when we say co the coalition of conservatives, we are not talking about uh, a coalition composed of all you know, hardline elements because a group of them are hardliners, a group of them are conservative who are not, uh, conservatives who are not hardliners. But the coalition that was supported by, by, by the hardliners, the coalition that was competing with the reformist uh, candidates, they sent 78 candidates to the parliament in the first round of the elections. You see that the coalition that was supported by, by, by the reformists was more successful. And 60 candidates did not belong to any uh, of the lists, the list, of, the list that was supported by, a cons uh, by the coalition <coughs> of conservatives and the list of reformists. These 60 candidates, uh, some of them were independent candidates. They did not belong to any major political tendencies. They were, for example, famous political, famous social figures in their constituencies. <coughs> Many of them are conservatives. But why weren't they in the list of the coalition of conservatives? Because simply because of the reason that in their constituency, the conservatives preferred some other candidates to them. And it was the reason they were not put in the list of the coalition of conservatives. Five of them are, are the, the, the candidates of uh, religious minorities, the Jews, Christians, Zoroastrians, who do not engage in political debates too much, but normally if they vote, they vote for uh, moderates. <clears throat> and uh, uh, 69 other candidates should be elected in the second round of the elections. And uh, the, the, the candidates who went, uh, who, who went to the second round of the elections, one half of them do not belong to any major coalitions. One quarter of them are the members of the list, the major list of the reformists. And one quarter of them belong to the major risk of the conservatives. This is the, 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 the plan of the election that we had recently in Iran. And we should bear in mind that uh, the coalition of reformists, I mean the reformists and moderate conservatives, they had only 233 candidates in this election. Uh, it means that they could not compete for 290 seats in the parliament because they had not enough candidates. So they were, they were by definition restrained in how much they could win. Yeah, exactly. Right. They could not compete for a, any, every single seat. And given this fact, the level of their success was significant in this election. And when and, it comes- And why? Yeah. What, 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 did, what were people voting for when they, when they were voting for, the, for, for that party list? You, you know, in fact, in this election, perhaps the, the divide between reformists and conservatives was not the main divide in this election. Mm -hmm. They were pro-Rohani government mm -hmm. candidates and anti-Rohani government candidates. Mm -hmm. And people for different reasons, many people for different results, reasons prefer to, to, to support the Rohani government. For example, I assume that the most important reason was the nuclear deal, mm -hmm. because the ninth parliament- Which is exists. popular. Mm -hmm. which, which is yeah. popular, mm -hmm. which is popular. And uh, the other camp is opposed to the nuclear deal and many people rightly or wrongly believe that this deal will make positive changes in their ordinary life. It was the reason why many people voted for, for the candidates who supported Rouhani and wanted to prevent uh, hardline candidates to become mm -hmm. uh, MPs. It is interesting that uh, out of 290 seats of the parliament, up to this point, it means after the first round of the elections, 191 members of parliament could not be re-elected. And it was a big no to the existing parliament that made a lot of problems for the Rouhani government and especially for the nuclear deal. Finally, the nuclear deal so was, it was a vote, So the, in general, a vote was, it was a vote of support for Rouhani and for the, for the nuclear deal. Rouhani and for the nuclear deal. Of course, people vote for different reasons, but I believe that supporting the nuclear deal was one of the most important reasons why people voted for pro-Rouhani candidates. Especially, uh, we should bear in mind that in the camp of Rouhani, 
the candidates in the camp of Rouhani were not famous because most of the famous candidates, the pro-Rouhani candidates, were disqualified by the Guardian Council. Mm -hmm. So they had to choose, you know, their, their, the, the, most of the first-class candidates were disqualified. So it was a competition by the help of the second and third-class candidates of reformists and some conservatives and some independent candidates in different constituencies. Mm -hmm. It is about just, just the measures. About the assembly of experts, perhaps we can explain later. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll ask um, Hossein Rassam, could you speak a little bit, I've, I've, we've talked a little bit about who the reformer moderates are, can you talk a little bit about the conservatives? Uh, yeah, uh, um, who, I would be who happy Who are to. they, what were the reasons why they underperformed, um, and you, you know, why did they seem to become so polarized in the last days of the campaign, and what does is, what is their loss mean? Okay. Well, to answer your question, I think we first need to make a, let's say, a general observation about um, Iran's uh, politics. Um, as I had mentioned, um, reformists dominated the, the, the parliament um, more than 12 years ago. Uh, and what has, what has actually happened is that we've witnessed a shift in Iran's political spectrum, which means there's been a shift towards the right. So reformists, <coughs> as we used to know them, have been either marginalized or let's say, removed. As a result of this, uh, what happened was that people who used to belong to, let's say, closer to center have now become the new so-called reformists, such as Mr. Rafsanjani himself or Mr. Rouhani. And that is why I think we could, we'd better not use the term reformers or reformists for them. And I, I prefer the, the word moderate, as um, mm -hmm. others have been using, or uh, pragmatists. Mm -hmm. I think the best term to describe them is pragmatists, especially Mr. Rouhani himself. Uh, with this shift, Rafsanjani and Rouhani moving to the left, the new center has been occupied by Ali Larajani, the Speaker of the Parliament. And and this new center, I think, is, is, uh, is very significant. And the reason for that is we see a split within the conservative camp, or hardliners, or principalists, whatever we would like to call them. And this split has actually been growing. It's been growing deeper um, during the past even six, seven years. This is actually what happened even in the eighth parliament, um, the one before um, the outgoing parliament, when Lari Jani replaced Haddad Adel, who until then was the speaker of the parliament. Um, and Lari Jani, by occupying the center, got closer to people like Rouhani and Rafsanjani. And what happened in this particular election, which I think is, uh, is of particular significance, is that this split, as it, as it got deeper, it also got wider. And what happened was that Mr. Larijani, by growing closer to Rouhani, his um, rival in the conservative camp, in the principalist camp, Haddad Adel, kind of separated his way from Larijani and created, um, let's say, his own coalition to challenge Larijani as well. And that is how they ended up, have, we ended up having a principalist list of candidates in which people like Lari Jani were, and, and his, his candidates, his um, um, uh, cohorts <laughs> were not included. Um, so in this manner, what happened in this election was that we actually saw, as, as Hossein and Said both mentioned, we saw a polarized election uh, over support for Rouhani's administration. <laughs> and hardliners led by Haddad Adel became the critics and the, the critics opponents of Rouhani. of Rouhani, whereas Lari Jani tried to and remain their, And their opposition was largely about the nuclear issue. It or was, uh, yeah, this is a very good question. As a matter of fact, what, what actually happened was that, uh, well, there, there were a number of reasons, for example, small reasons. As, as the head of the um, uh, cyber security police mentioned the other day, um, that a lot of the, the campaign- Iranian cyber security Yes, police. yes. Um, a lot that, of the- That's a British <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he hardly knows about the Iranian elections, I think. Um, what happened was that um, almost 80% of um, the campaigning that happened on social media was through Telegram. 
as, the, as now becoming the most popular um, sort of platform um, for, for um, communication among Iranians. And of course, moderates took advantage of it um, pretty well. There are a number of reasons, but I think something important is that something hardliners missed uh, was that they made a tactical mistake, and it was that they had a campaign of their own, which was, which was somehow doing OK. They had their own motto, which was um, uh, livelihood, security, and progress, mm -hmm. um, as um, on many occasions sort of outlined by, by the Supreme Leader. Those are quite vague terms. They are vague, but if, uh, at the same time, of course, Madras did not even have one, I mean, a proper one. They did, they did not have um, sort of a focal point, let's say. Um, but what happened when, when the Supreme Leader started talking about the, 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 the British plot and, and that sort of thing, they thought, well, this is the bandwagon we can jump on. And they started, and they joined that rhetoric. Not, not everybody knows about the British plot. This was oh, explained yeah. to me right before we came on stage. Would you mind two words, two sentences <laughs> about, because this played an interesting role in the campaign. What was the British plot, and, the, and why did the hardliners? Nine days before, before the elections, Ayatollah Khamenei himself warned about a British plot in the elections to influence the elections in Iran. And it polarized the elections in Iran, you know, many because it was very difficult for for, for moderates to synthesize the, the, the public opinion about the election of the Assembly of Experts. Because in the, the, the election of the Assembly of Experts, there were two competing lists uh, uh, that half of the list were in common. Because, because the moderates had not enough candidates, <laughs> they were forced to put you know, in their own list uh, a group of uh, conservatives and even hardliners in order to be able to compete, in order to, to be able to fill their list. For example, in Tehran, they had 16. Tehran has 16 seats in the Assembly of Experts. Moderates had not 16 candidates of their own. So half of their list were filled with, uh, was filled by the, the candidates of the other list. It was very difficult for moderates to, 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 to make the, the public opinion sensitive about such an election. People looked at two lists and understood that, OK, they are both uh, bunches of old clerics, old conservative clerics. What is the reason to choose between them? And uh, it was very difficult for, 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 for the reformists to synthesize the public opinion about this election. And Ayatollah Khamenei himself served the reformists and moderates by, by making the public opinion sensitive about this election, by warning about the British plot. Which was, to su was supposedly to support the reformists, to supp to the, the more liberal. Yeah, the, the British. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, after the warning of Ayatollah Khamenei. Then suddenly everyone became aware that there was this distinction there between were, these two. There was a real competition, in their opinion. Right. And, and you know, and uh, the, 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 the most important aim of ref the reformists in this election was not about the 16 seats of Tehran, was about the top of the list and the bottom of the list. They wanted their own candidates, like Rafsanjani, to be elected in the top of the list of the, 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 the elected members of the assembly. And they wanted the three major hardline candidates to be eliminated or to be in the, in the, the, the the, 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 the last positions of the list of the, the elected right. candidates at Tehran. Tehran. And finally, because the public opinion was synthesized, uh, uh, two candidates out of the three major hardline candidates were eliminated, completely eliminated. And the third the, one was put in the 16th place, right, the, the essence, last place. The essence of it was that it was a kind of own goal. That, exactly. That, that Khamenei said, you know, the British are trying to make you vote for the wrong list. And then everybody woke up and said, oh, is that the wrong, is that the list we should vote for? Of, of course, it doesn't mean that <laughs> the people wanted to do something for the British. No, no, I know, but, but I know. You know <laughs> but people understood, the people understood that, you know, the bad guys don't want this list, so we will vote for this list. Right, That's exactly. simple. <laughs> That's interesting, it's really interesting. But at the same time, yeah. Go on. Sorry, you can, and then I'm gonna, I need to bring in something. Yeah. Um, so that was the tactical mistake, which um, they, they could have avoided. Right. But at the same time, let's not forget that this is, we, are, we, are, we may focus too much on Tehran. But at the same time, they made a strategic mistake. And the strategic mistake was that um, at a time that most of Iranian people 
regardless of, of their political inclination, political leaning, uh, are filled with hope and obviously at the same time demands for a better future, um, better, uh, I mean, the top four priorities that Iranians have right now are empl uh, employment, live better living standards, fight against corruption and individual freedom. And what, uh, what actually happened was that all of a sudden, hardliners presented themselves as the impediment to all those hopes. And this, did, this obviously did not work in their favor. They were, they were critical of Rouhani's performance, which was fine. I mean, they could have serious demands. But all of a sudden, what happened was that they turned into the issue of those demands. Mm -hmm. and, and it was not um, helping them. But that, I mean, having said all that, let's not forget that um, hardliners that we talk about. In many areas, they did quite badly. In some other areas, they didn't. Um, for example, in um, the eight major Iranian cities um, in the country uh, with, a popula with almost one third of the population of the country, um, ref uh, Madras obviously did better. Um, out of 50 seats that were decided in the first round, the pro-Rohani candidates got 37 of them. So obviously this was, this was a big uh, victory for them. Um, but the, the issue here is that those eight major cities only have 58 seats in the, in the parliament, not more than that. And there are many more smaller constituencies which play a bigger role in, in, in the majlis, in, in the parliament. And even in Tehran itself, let's not forget that Mr. Haddad Adel, who led the um, sort of hardline camp, if you like, he got more than a million votes. His votes are only 600,000 smaller than mm -hmm. Mr. Arif, who was, who was the leading figure in the, in the pro-government um, list. Um, and if you're talking about Tehran, let's just move slightly outside of Tehran to, a, to another city very close to the capital, which is Karach. Mm -hmm. It's just a half an hour's drive from, uh, from Tehran with a big population. I mean, almost uh, the number of um, the, the size of the electorate was 1.3 uh, million people. What happened in Karach was obviously the turnout uh, was, was bigger than the last time. Um, as Tehran was, of course, um, and more than half of the uh, half of the voters went to to, to the polls. Uh, but what happened was that hardliners didn't even have candidates there. They didn't issue a, a, a list of candidates there. Uh, Pro-government um, people did. What happened in the end was that the hardline uh, candidate won the election with more than 25 percent of the votes, and a, 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 a sort of conservative leaning independent came second. So, so even in a city like Karaj, in which, I mean, we see many similarities between Karaj and Tehran in terms of lifestyle and many, many other issues, we see that this also happens. So I, I think, yes, the result, the overall result, the overall outcome was very important. But at the same time, we could not forget the fact that hardliners, conservatives do have a um, power base, base um, in the well. country. Thank you. Um, can I now turn to Sanam and ask you to talk a little bit about what the significance is of the elections for not really just, I don't, I don't, not necessarily Iran's foreign policy, but Iran's attitude to the outside world. Um, several people have said in different ways that the, you, can, you could construe this vote as a vote for the nuclear agreement and therefore a vote for engagement with foreigners. Um, a lot of people in London would like to know if Iran is going to become an, an easier place to visit and to invest in and to engage with. What, do, does the election tell us anything about that? Um, all important issues. The election tells us uh, more than anything that uh, with a high degree of participation, uh, the regime can ch tick a couple of boxes. They can uh, tick the box, um, as everyone here has already mentioned, of the legitimacy box, and mm -hmm. that's very important. Uh, the second uh, box that they can tick is uh, this is a consensus-based regime. Decisions are made based on consensus. So uh, being able to show legitimacy gives the regime greater confidence to take wide-ranging decisions, such as the nuclear deal. 
Um, and the nuclear deal is, of course, uh, been uh, provided a big shift in Iran's relationships with the world, um, particularly uh, with the P5 plus one, and we've also seen the ramifications of that in the region. Um, and this election, uh, basically for Rouhani's government, was a referendum on the nuclear deal. That's how it was perceived. Mm -hmm. um, and going forward, it is going to become a part of his uh, foreign policy agenda, which is very much tied to his uh, domestic agenda. And the two go hand in hand because economic diplomacy is going to be tied into the <laughs> domestic agenda of increased living standards, uh, reducing unemployment, um, and that is intimately tied to uh, bilateral and multilateral relationships both in uh, the Middle East and in uh, Europe and in Asia in bringing uh, the return of foreign companies to Iran. The Iranian government has uh, argued and stated that they need $5 billion a year. Um, in a plethora of different industries. They say they're open for business. This is the last emerging market to emerge. Um, and uh, economic diplomacy is going to be sort of the first pillar of Rouhani's strategy going forward in uh, trying to improve uh, the domestic economic arena, but at the same time, uh, building relationships, uh, both regionally, both uh, to the east and both to the west. Uh, so I think that we should say uh, Iran it is open for business. It is looking for uh, a more integrated uh, economy, and with that, it, it's definitely going to be tied into improved relationships. But we should also not overestimate um, change coming from Iran with its, re with its foreign policy, if you will. Uh, Iran's foreign policy is predicated on also a number of pillars, one of them being independence. One of the first slogans of the revolution was neither east nor west. And I think that ideology still is very uh, relevant today in how Iran positions itself in the world. It wants to be independent. It doesn't want to be beholden to any one country, to any one region. Uh, and it wants to have a diversified relationship uh, with uh, countries around the world. And as a result, also diversified economic investments from different countries around the world. That is a way to maintain also Iran's security and also to prevent foreign countries from interfering in Iran's I, I was just going to ask you, you know, foreign investment, when, when, when countries have been very closed off and they open up to it, foreign investment inevitably changes the dynamic inside mm -hmm. a country because, um, you know, it's, it's money that the government doesn't control and it's, you know, ch business choices and decisions that, mm -hmm. aren't, being, that aren't being controlled from, from Tehran. Is, is this government not worried about that? Is there no... Is there no fear about that? No, there definitely is fear about that, actually. Um, I mean, we know full well that President Obama has, himself has basically argued and su suggested that this nuclear deal is going to translate into long-term uh, political change, being the end game, the soft coup uh, mm. being the goal. And uh, there is a lot of fear in Iran. And this is coming out uh, not just from the official ins governmental institutions, but also other inf influential decision-making bodies and influencers in the country, the most important of, of course, being the Revolutionary Guard Corps, which is very fearful of this long-term gain, as is the Supreme Leader Khamenei, as is hardliners. And so uh, that's why, in a way, Iran's policies going forward, at least in my opinion, are going to continue to be uh, somewhat schizophrenic, despite the fact that they've signed the nuclear deal, which was an economic deal, in my opinion. It's about bringing money back mm -hmm. and bringing stability and improving the lot of Iranians and the regime. And the ending the embargoes. Exactly. Mm -hmm through sanctions, but at the same time, there's a dual game going on in the country about uh, who is going to win the contracts and how to make sure all of the different groups in the countries, the Revolutionary Guards as well, are beneficiaries of these deals. Mm -hmm. And Hossein and I wrote about this, um, what, six months ago, a year ago? Okay, a while ago, it seems. <laughs> time is flying by. The um, but there is a competing agenda between uh, two groups. One that is looking for uh, integration, uh, economic integration, uh, eventually also a regional and political integration, and another group that is looking for more interaction and relationships that are more secure. So let's say the IRGC is going to look um, for relationships with countries and companies that they can trust 
the Chinas of the world, which mean, the Russias right. of the world. Which means, which means countries and companies that won't criticize them or pose some kind of opposition to their values. That aren't going to be putting asterisks right. in their contracts about human rights or labor reform or women and, and gender issues. Uh, yeah. So, you know, there is, there is this sort of dance that is going on, and it's going to continue to go on. And it's going on over the petroleum contracts. There is a delay in the February announcement of the petroleum contracts in London, and it's, it's part of the uh, internal negotiations. <laughs> taking place in Tehran as to how everyone can benefit from this and profit from this equitably and fairly. Or inequitably. Or inequitably from our perspective, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to add something to that? Um, well, I mean, what, what Sanam mentioned, I think, is, is the economy is, is at the heart of this battle, at the top of the um, leadership pyramid, about the, the direction in which the, the Islamic Republic should, should move. Um, one view um, represented by people such as uh, President Rouhani holds that we need long-term security and long that long-term security comes through less militarization um, in the region and more integration into, into global economy um, so that we become an integral part of that globalized economy. And in this manner, we, as, as we sort of um, get into, into the network, then we are more secure. But for the supreme leader, I think I, I have something here. But for people like the, the, the supreme leader, interaction is OK. He's aware, as, as the others are, um, that foreign investment is, is badly needed. I mean, Iran needs at least $60 billion of, of foreign um, investment every year. And, and the economy is not doing well. Many issues on, on unemployment, even not unemployment, but um, even um, economic participation rate in Iran is pretty low. It's, it's about 42 percent. And, and um, this is not very, very, very uh, beneficial by the, by, for the country. But um, I quote the Supreme Leader, Ayatollah Khamenei here, uh, just from a few months back. Of course, it was um, no, almost a year ago. Um, and he talked about this, about this, this difference between the two uh, <coughs> approaches. He said, one view suggests indigenous progress, while the other argues we need to change our foreign policy for the economy, for the sake of the economy, for, for the economy to get fixed. Um, we need to, that other view, work with the big powers so that the economy could prosper. The second view he's talking about, which is indirectly referring to people such as um, President Rouhani, the second view has proven to be wrong, useless, and barren. Progress is not being um, digested or integrated um, into world order. So from the point of view of Vaitala Khamenei, interaction is fine, foreign investment is fine, but if that means gradual transformation of the country, mm. um, economic, then social, then political, then, have um, then, and they've been talking about this, then collapse can happen, mm -hmm. just like the Soviet Union. Yeah. Yes, let me, let me just bring in um, yes, I, Said. Well, a couple of points, if I may. And, and then we'll get questions. Yes, so. of course. I, I think the, the, the Supreme Leader is not so much worried about transformation, but capitulation. He's worried about the speed of, of, of change. I, I don't think he's totally against change. The fact that he has uh, accepted Rouhani into power, the fact that he's accepted the current elections uh, in, in practice, uh, shows that he's, he's not against change. But he is worried, I think, the, the, at the speed that that change might happen. <coughs> that if it's going too fast, that uh, control might be lost. <laughs> and therefore, we might get into a state of chaos. And out of the discussions uh, which, uh, which uh, well, the presentations which were made, I just want to uh, stress the point that we should not underestimate the position of the, uh, of, of the, of the right wing and the, and the uh, uh, hardliners. You know, b because we, we are in the West, we're more liberal minded, we're more uh, democratic in our perspectives, we tend to look down on the, uh, uh, the, 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 the right wingers and, and belittle them, while we really have to um, uh, acknowledge their position in the political establishment, and more importantly, out of these elections, ex uh, uh, acknowledge the fact they have uh, uh, accepted the results of this defeat, I'm not going to say with grace, 
but with a degree of uh, uh, of uh, of caution, yes, which this, I think is an important point, point yeah. which needs to be uh, uh, stressed. Yeah. No, you made this point, but did you want to add? That, <coughs> I do agree with Mr. Rassam, but I just want to add one point. You know, I think the most important reason why Ayatollah Khamenei and his allies accepted the results of the recent election with no serious objection, or the, the most important reason why they accepted the results, uh, the outcome of the 2009 presidential election, which brought Mr. Rouhani to, to power, was a uh, 2013 uh, presidential election that brought Mr. Rouhani to power was, was the outcome of the 2009 presidential elections after the 2000 and the massive rigging massive election fraud in the 2009 presidential election you know that there was an unprecedented protest in Iran and that it really frightened the the, the, the Islamic regime in Iran and it was the reason why Ayatollah Khamenei did not want to repeat the same experience and I believe it was the most important reason why they accepted the outcome of the 2013 presidential election that brought Mr. Rouhani to power. Uh, so accepting, you know, I don't know whether to call they it did a, not a, a bit more moderates is, an, yeah. is a way of putting off greater protest. Yeah, I, I think if they wanted to, 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 to rig again the elections, nobody was sure about the reaction of the society. Mm -hmm. Of course, there are different estimations, but nobody could be sure about the, the, the reaction of the society. So they were very cautious this time. And about they rigged it in advance by deciding who could run. Yeah. And right. even today, even today, Mr. Khamenei said that, okay, he, 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 was, he was addressing, uh, uh, in fact, he, he was in fact talking to the, the reformists. He said that, okay, compare the reaction of the conservative candidates to this election, to this recent election, with the reaction of the others, the reformists, to the 2009 presidential elections. We, yeah, yeah, he just said that. You, you, you see that that time when they lost the elections, you know, there was such reactions in the streets of Tehran and other cities of Iran, but they accepted the, 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 the results of the elections very, very, very smoothly and with no protest, and this is a lesson for the others. You know, oh, I see. he is always in the, you know, he's, he's always in the context of the 2009 presidential elections that made a significant change in Iran's political spectrum, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. I will now um, cl close our, um, our, our small debate. I'm sorry that it was so short and people had such a uh, I'd like to hear all four of you actually speak for greater length and, and thank all the panelists very much for their contribution.